This image in the chaos that followed the airport explosion. Now she's spoken to the BBC for the first time. Welcome, good to have you with us. Here we are live just outside the Maracanã Stadium where we are five hours away from the opening ceremony that will signal the official start of the Rio 2016 Games. Uh, as you can see behind me, we've got volunteers, officials, some athletes I think will be milling through at some point here, but crucially the artists that are going to be taking part in the ceremony. I have to say it's pretty calm here. A few hours ago, eerily uh, calm, as uh, this complete area surrounding the Maracanã Stadium has been locked down by the security. The roads have been blocked and anybody who doesn't have uh, accreditation to come into the area is not able to get in to uh, this part of town. But uh, you do get a sense the anticipation is building. But uh, when you're on the road, and you're moving around a little bit around this city it is quiet because it is a public holiday here today and you get the sense that the locals here the cariocas are perhaps heeding the advice of the mayor of the city eduardo Pais, who told them yesterday to stay away to ease the congestion of the thousands that are going to be heading here to Maracanã Stadium. But of course, these Olympics have been marred in the build-up by a lot of controversy. The Zika virus, the pollution of a lot of the waterways that are holding sporting events. The Russian athletes, of course, where we heard yesterday the official announcement from the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, clearing the way for at least 271 Russian athletes to now take part in these Rio Games. But as my colleague Rira Davis now reports, the focus is on the opening ceremony and whether or not Rio can deliver. The Batista family will have one of the best views in Rio for tonight's opening ceremony. The famous Maracanã, the scene of so many sporting triumphs, dominates the skyline. But despite their vantage point, how much have people in these communities been touched by the Olympic spirit? Let's be honest, the tickets are expensive for us, but the Games have brought good things for the city and for us who live here. His daughter Stephanie, who's an umpire in the track and field events, can barely contain her enthusiasm. I'm really excited. I can't wait for it to start and be part of it. After a marathon journey around this vast, culturally diverse country, the Olympic torch visited some of Rio's most famous landmarks. There's probably never been a more stunning backdrop for an Olympic Games. This is the first time the Games have taken place in South America. A proud moment for the continent and for many Brazilians. Public support for the Games has sometimes felt patchy. In many areas where there's been little investment, the question is, who are these Olympics for? But as the opening ceremony nears, there's been plenty of enthusiasm, some protest and a lot of security. 85,000 troops have already been deployed on the city streets and there have been rumours of more demonstrations outside tonight's ceremony. Saúde! Saúde! Health! Health! shouts one protester, amid real anger at the billions being spent staging the Olympics, when Rio has arguably more pressing priorities. This is a city undoubtedly transformed by the Games, some new infrastructure and urban regeneration there have been missed opportunities too in a city with still high levels of inequality. The Olympic Games perhaps not providing as much momentum for change as had been promised. Wira Davis, BBC News, Rio. Well, here, as we were saying, the security operation is very heavy. It's uh, actually, in fact, the biggest uh, presence of security on the streets of Rio in Brazil's history here. It's estimated that some 85,000 police and army will be deployed over the course of the Games to ensure the safety of everyone attending and participating in the Games, which is probably why you get a sense here of complete regulation and, and quite quiet, I should say, as we count down the hours to the opening ceremony. But it's a very different situation if you are in a fan zone in the the city and the largest is in fact in the port region of Rio it's uh, downtown Rio where my colleague Julia Canero is and uh, you've been uh, speaking to uh, lots of the fans there who are getting very excited and a bit of samba dancing I understand as well 
Yes, Babita, only in the live intervals. I can't dance on air, but let's go to the fans. Well, lots of excitement here in the fan zone. This is the harbor area of Rio, and I've been talking to some people to find out how they're building up their excitement just hours ahead of the opening ceremony. And uh, Julia, a lot has been spoken of regarding the uh, security issues and also the fact that there are planned protests uh, taking place. We don't know how big they're going to be, uh, but of course we should uh, make the point that this is a, a city and a country that is uh, facing a political uncertain times here as a suspended President Dilma Rousseff is facing an impeachment trial. So any sense there that people are perhaps worried about security and what those protests, if they take place in large numbers, might mean? Babita, there are protests going on in two different places in Rio today uh, because of the political situation in the country and also uh, some activists gathering, uh, protesting against what they call human rights violations in the run-up to the games. But here really the atmosphere is very festive. There are fans from around the world and also fans from Rio. And I've asked some fans to join us and help us find out a little bit more about the atmosphere. This is Hakeo and her mother, Glaucia. They're from Rio and they went to their first football match, first yeah. ever football match. Yeah, that was my first and I, actually I'm a soccer fan, a really soccer fan and I love soccer a lot. So it was a really special moment. You know? So you were watching Brazil and China, the yeah. opening match of women's football. Yeah, exactly. It was great. I mean. We were cheering up for the girls, and they they were doing their jobs, and they they went great. I mean, it was the best, perfect. It was the perfect first match I could ever imagine. Okay, thank you so much, Hakao. Enjoy. And Brazil won three nil against China on that match. And there are other fans here from other parts of the world, also the Southern Hemisphere. New Zealand, all made your way all the way down here to Rio. Yep. So, what brought you here to the Olympics? Um, my partner's niece is in the sevens team. Yeah, Woman's my seven. Portia Woodman, she's playing in the uh, women's sevens and it's the first time for any of our family to have made the Olympics so we've come all the way from New Zealand from a little town called Kaikohe to support her. And what are your first impressions of the city? There was so much negative uh, news in the build up. Um, we love it. It's, it's more than what we expected it to be. There's just so much to do. It's so lively and vibrant. Yeah, love it definitely coming back okay perfect thank you so much and good luck to your niece thank you very much. and well Babita there as I said lots of excitement here ahead of the opening ceremony this is the one of the three fan zones in the city where the opening ceremony will be transmitted but also we'll have concerts during the games we'll have all the competitions being shown live so this is where many people, well, if they don't want to make spend money with tickets, they'll be able to come here, enjoy the competitions, and also have some fun, some good music with a good atmosphere. Absolutely. You've definitely got the atmosphere there, Julia, but I think that uh, as we count down the hours, it's going to be all happening right here because the creative director of what is uh, taking place in the Maracanã Stadium is Fernando Morelos, who is the... Uh, famous director, of course, from uh, the movie City of God and the Constant Gardener. And uh, he has said uh, in the last few hours that, you know what, we are dealing with uh, tough times in terms of austerity. They've got a tenth of the budget that London 2012 had to host this opening ceremony. And he said, you know, Athens was classical, London was smart, Brazil is going to be cool with a capital C. Indeed, Babita, a lot of mystery surrounding what this uh, opening ceremony is going to look like. Of course, a lot cheaper than the one that London stage. We've had some sad news in the past uh, couple of hours that Pele, the footballing great, won't be actually lighting the cauldron. So all the talk in the newsroom is who might be filling those massive shoes. Yeah, it's not just the talk where you are, Tom, it's uh, all around here on the streets of Rio because it was very much tipped that it would be Pele. Who else? but could possibly do that honour of lighting the torch here in the Maracanã Stadium. And as you said, he released a statement uh, in the last uh, two hours or so saying that I am not in a physical condition to take part in the opening ceremony. Pelé has been suffering from ill health for some time now. And that's a uh, really devastating news for the many uh, fans here in uh, the city that were expecting that it would be him and that it should be him. But now people are thinking about 
who could it possibly be? And uh, possible names being spoken about is the sailor. He is uh, an Olympic medalist, uh, five-time Olympic medalist, uh, Torbin Grail. He could possibly carry the torch and light the cauldron here in the Maracanã. Also, another name is the tennis star, Brazilian tennis star, Gustavo Curtin. So we will find out uh, who exactly that's going to be. But as you say, the opening ceremony starts at 8 o'clock local time. And we still don't exactly know how it's going to run. But we do know that Anita, the uh, famous uh, Brazilian pop sensation, is going to be singing alongside two iconic uh, Brazilian musicians. And also the Britain actress, actress Dame, Dame Judi Dench is going to be making a uh, speech. Uh, well, reading out a poem, I should say. Uh, Brazilian poem. So that's all we know. As soon as we get any more information, Tom, we'll let you know. Thank you very much, uh, Babita. Just before you go, I have to ask you about the uh, ceremony itself. Of course, a lot of mystery clouded in that one. But of course, behind you, it's been quite empty throughout the day, I understand. But now those crowds slowly building up. I, I've heard that locals have been told to stay away and many have heeded that advice. Yeah, we said that a little bit earlier, didn't we, Tom? The fact that, uh, you know, even when we were traveling from the west zone to the north zone here at the American Isle, it usually takes about an hour or so. The Olympic lanes were flowing freely. The traffic was actually very light. And that's something I haven't been able to say in the last week that we've been here. And you do get the sense that they have been listening to that advice that was given from the mayor of the city to stay away. But you know what? We are still, what, five hours, less than five hours away from the opening ceremony. And that could all change because you look at where we are. And like I said, the security presence means that anybody with authorization is allowed access here. Anybody that's not got accreditation cannot come into this area. Uh, where Julia is, as we just saw a short time ago in one of the fan zones in downtown Rio, it's a different picture there. You've got a lot of more people milling around. So it'll be interesting to see how the situation here changes. But at the moment, calm, almost too calm, but the city is ready to host the opening ceremony in a few hours' time. Well, enjoy the tranquil mode, what will be before two weeks of insane action i'm sure babita thank you very much there with the best seats in the house overlooking the olympic stadium there in rio thanks babita now from south america to south africa where the governing african national congress has just recorded its worst ever electoral performance in local elections the anc has admitted defeat in the key battleground of nelson mandela bay which includes the city of port elizabeth nomsa maseko has this report from johannesburg the governing ANC has been handed its first major election setback since it ushered in democracy in 1994. This is the first time the party of Nelson Mandela won less than 60 percent, an embarrassment and a major psychological blow even though it still commands huge support countrywide. There has also been other issues that affected the African National Congress, but uh, broadly the ANC has done fairly well against all odds. But infighting, court cases and a host of corruption scandals, some involving President Jacob Zuma, are widely seen as the reason for the ANC's weakening support. What I would say to ANC is that they need to learn from their opposition. They need to take um, the citizens of South Africa very seriously. The municipal election results show that the ANC's power and influence is slowly declining. The party is coming to the realization that it can no longer take it for granted that the country's black majority will follow it blindly. The official opposition Democratic Alliance unseated the ANC in Nelson Mandela Bay, an area with a rich history of anti-apartheid struggle. We're very, very happy with uh, the results so far. Uh, it's 95% counted. We're still waiting for results from Johannesburg and Tswane, uh, but uh, indications are that we've uh, it looks like we're going to do very well in both those municipalities. But none of the parties have won an outright majority in fiercely contested cities, including the capital, Pretoria, and Johannesburg, the country's economic hub. This puts Julius Malema's economic freedom fighters, which won 8% of votes nationwide, in a strong position to be the kingmakers. Essentially, the people of South Africa gave us keys uh, to the classroom on a historic lesson in humility and we will be opening it to put the ANC in it so they may learn once and for all never again to think that they're indispensable but they must learn to respect the people's power to respect the people's mandate these municipal elections have no doubt proven that South Africa's political landscape 
is maturing into a competitive multi-party democracy. Nomsa Masego, BBC News, Pretoria. Let's take a look at what else is making news around the world today. And the death toll from the Bastille Day lorry attack in Nice has risen to 85 after a 56-year-old man seriously injured in the incident has died in hospital. The death was confirmed on Twitter by President of the French Riviera region, Christian Estrosi. He offered condolences to the family of the latest victim. At least 13 people have been killed in when suspected militants opened fire at a marketplace in the Indian town of Kokrajar. Police have blamed the attack on an insurgent group called the National Democratic Front of Bodoland. They say they have killed one militant. Indonesian police have arrested six men suspected of planning a terror attack on Singapore. The men who were arrested on this Indonesian island of Batam are alleged to have been plotting to fire a rocket into Singapore's Marina Bay. Singapore officials say they were aware of the plan and had stepped up security. The president of FIFA, Gianni Infantino, has been cleared of breaching the organization's ethics code following an investigation into his expenses, recruitment practices and the alleged sacking of whistleblowers. FIFA's ethics committee said it found nothing improper in the benefits he enjoyed and any concerns regarding his hiring methods were simply matters of internal compliance. Lawyers for the US-based Turkish cleric Fatula Gulen say they fear there could be an attack on his life. The Turkish government have blamed Mr Gulen for masterminding the recent failed coup there, an accusation he denies. The government have submitted evidence to the US in preparation for a formal extradition request. The woman who became the face of the attack on Brussels in March has given a special interview to the BBC. 35 people have died when 300 others were injured in the blast at the city's airport and a metro station. Nidhi Chapeka, featured in one of the most iconic images of the time, told the BBC in Mumbai that her children saw their mother's strength in the picture. The first time when I saw the picture, my eyes were only stuck, you know, on my face. It showed that how helpless I was at that particular time, how frightened I looked the agony, the pain, I spoke to my kids because I was worried about I have a son who is 14 years old. Seeing maybe a mom in half, uh, you know, say covered clothes, he may have felt, or my daughter who is 10 years old, she may have felt that, you know, my mom has been exposed to the world. I said, are you ashamed? They said, why we were? We were looking at your strength at that particular time, that even in this condition, your eyes are open, even in this condition, you're still wanting to be alive, and that's what it is. It was blast like a ball of fire, hit a sound, which has been, I think, so on the full volume, boom, like that. And the next, I found myself way away as if somebody kicked me from that place, and I was on the ground. Those cries, those, those cries of grief of people, those who were asking, where is my child? I'm calling for my child. I'm asking for help. People were crying because of pain. We have to live. We have to go on. Life have, has to move. It has to go for good. If you can do something better for someone, I think you have gained something and that's what I think so we have to, everybody has to think, that's it. That was the story behind one of the iconic images of the attack on Brussels which took place back in March. Now two pilots have had a lucky escape after their cargo plane overshot a runway in northern Italy. The Arayo El Serio International Airport was closed for two hours after the plane burst through a perimeter fence and onto a highway while trying to land. No one was injured, but the incident caused severe delays for holidaymakers. The airport, which is one of Italy's busiest, with more than 10 million passengers each year, has since reopened. The incident is being investigated. Now, so all eyes are on the Olympic Stadium in Brazil, of course, where just in a few hours' time, the opening ceremony of the Games will take place. And I'm happy to say we can cross back now to Babita Sharma there. Babita, it's not even the height of summer, but you're looking very warm where you are. 
I know this is how Brazilians do things. When it comes to winter, it's not like London, what I'm used to. Uh, yeah, this is Brazilian winter. It's 27 degrees here. It is boiling for me anyway uh, but actually the last few days it's been raining and cloudy so uh, day changes uh, the climate here changes day by day I uh, just want to though I don't know if you can hear the noise behind me but we've got um, young kids uh, volunteers and possibly even participants in the opening ceremony clapping and jeering at the moment as they've got seats in the Maracanã Stadium just to give you an idea of the ticket prices uh, the cheapest seats costed around about $60 the most expensive for this opening ceremony ranges at around about $1,300. We think it's been completely sold out. We're just waiting to verify that. As soon as we know, we will let you know. But it's a 45,000 seat capacity stadium there in the uh, Maracanã and 206 nations uh, the athletes from those 206 nations and also a refugee team are going to be coming through, uh, of course, uh, bearing their flags for uh, the competitions as they get underway in the coming weeks. And all the focus will be on what the athletes are wearing. A short time ago, I was joined by the Brazilian fashion blogger, Maga Mura, who has been looking at the athletes' uniforms in detail. She joined me to talk about uh, that and also her favourite. No guesses for which one you think she likes. Brazil, of course. Brazil brings like the nature, the forests and the flowers and birds, bring the, the real color of the country, the, the flags. And I love the hat because it reminds the soul, the soul of the samba. In Brazil is a play, is a country of samba and the hat looks like amazing. Um, but they bring the colors and the designer is a beachwear designer. And Lenny Neymar is the designer yeah, behind yeah, that yeah. and a lot of attention on their designs because it's a big moment. Yeah, it's a big moment in the world and was Lenny Niemeyer with a big fast, fast fashion that's so big in Brazil, it's not Brazilian, but they are so big here and I love the colors, I love the... Okay, well let's talk about Canada, you yes, mentioned. Canada. Why Canada? My favorite, I love this quiet, just did a really nice job because they are famous of the jeans and but this blazer with the iconic maple leaf, I love it and I could wear this in the day, you know, in my routine. That, that doesn't look like a uniform and it's amazing, I love it. A lot has been said about uh, the Georgia team. Yeah. Uh, I remember when the announcement came out from the designer uh, showcasing what the athletes were wearing, people were saying, I can't believe you're dressing them like this because they said it was too traditional. Yeah. Yeah, it's too traditional as a lot of uniforms, like it's not all the uniforms that are so kind of cool, you know. But I think the concept behind it from uh, the designer said that uh, he got his inspiration from medieval yeah. Georgian time. Yeah. So make yeah. of that what you will. I think they're going to be quite hot because the uh, uniforms are long and the temperatures yeah. today are what? 27 degrees here. So yeah. being cool is probably going to be very important. Yeah, they're going to kind of die tonight, today, tonight because the day here is so hot. And it's so strange, like the uniform. I don't, I don't like so much. We should talk about Cuba because uh, they've yeah. hit the headlines with their uniform. Tell us why. Yeah, they have the Louboutin, the designer, and I love the sneakers and the colors like beige, beige with red, the little little flag in the blazer. It's amazing. It's so chic and elegant. And Louboutin like was um, just made the collaboration with Enrique. He's a French handball player and they create like a really nice uniform for the Olympics. Yeah, all the designers are here, aren't they? Christian Louboutin for Cuba and uh, for Team GB, Stella McCartney. Yes, GB is amazing too. Stella McCartney has a big experience in do like sportswear clothes because of her, part, her collaboration with Adidas. It's like 12 years, I think. So she did a really nice line and the, the uniform and the, the clothes to wear during the, the games is like 10% uh, lighter than was in 2012. Maga Mura there speaking to me a short time ago. Um, I am, of course, impartial, but my favourite uniform that I've seen is Team GB, designed, of course, by Stella McCartney. Just want to give you a look at what we can see behind us because lots more activities now. These are what you're looking at. The uh, performers, let's say, uh, that are going to be uh, taking part in the opening ceremony. But you can't really tell much from what they're wearing because they're just in t-shirt and trousers at the moment. But I'm being told there's over a thousand costumes out here uh, that probably will represent all the Brazilian colours that you can think of. Lots of pageantry, lots of fun and of course, Tom, 
Samba. We're going to continue our coverage right up to the opening ceremony and, of course, beyond. Stay with us here for more on BBC World News. Thanks, Babita. A bit of Boston over as well, I'm sure. And don't forget, if you're not near a TV these Olympics, you can stay up to date with all the coverage on our website and mobile app. There's all the latest there. It's bbc.com forward slash news. All the stories, all the action, head to the website. Wherever you are in the world, whatever team, whatever individual you're going after these Olympics, I hope they perform well for you. That's it from us and the team. It's goodbye for now.